Ladies and gentlemen, the commander of the 4th Ranger Training Battalion, Lieutenant Colonel Aaron Billingsley. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Lieutenant Colonel Aaron Billingsley, commander of the 4th Ranger Training Battalion. On behalf of Colonel Dunmire, the commander of the Airborne Ranger Training Brigade, Major General Donahoe, the commanding general of Fort Benning, Georgia, we'd like to welcome you to the Hurley Hill Rangers in Action demonstration. We'd like to recognize some very special rangers. These rangers are here to see their sons and daughters graduate today, We're talking about second generation rangers, here to carry on the ranger legacy. At this time, if you're a ranger qualified, have a son or daughter graduating, please stand and be recognized. Last but not least, the Steely Eye Freedom Fighters, the graduates from Ranger Class 0721. <laughs> the demonstration you're about to see will showcase some of the techniques that we utilize to train both Ranger students and reconnaissance and surveillance students here at the Airborne Ranger Training Brigade. Your first narrator will be Staff Sergeant Babbitt, the United States Army Ranger. Sergeant in the 101st Airborne Division. Currently, I'm assigned to Bravo Company, 4th Ranger Training Battalion. The history of the American Ranger is a long and colorful, a proud heritage which dates back some 400 years. During the American colonial period, Ranger techniques and tactics were inherent characteristics of our frontiersmen. As early as the 1700s, these frontiersmen, commonly referred to as Rangers, would patrol the frontier from New England to the Carolinas in defense against the Indians. Probably the most famous and successful of these early units was Rogers Rangers, organized in 1756 by Major Robert Rogers. Presently, over 400 Ranger units have been formed by various leaders such as Morgan, Mosby, Merrill, and Darby. Their gallantry and success in combat are legendary. During World War II, Ranger battalions operated in the Mediterranean and in the South Pacific, and they led the way onto the beaches of Normandy. During the Korean conflict, volunteers were trained right here at Fort Benning and formed into 18 Airborne Ranger companies seven of which saw combat during the conflict. Ranger Company served in the Republic of Vietnam, from the Delta to the DMZ, providing long-range reconnaissance and surveillance to be the eyes and ears of their commanders on the battlefield. In 1983, the 1st and 2nd Ranger Battalions led the way when conducting an airborne assault onto the island of Grenada during Operation Urgent Fury. During that same time period, the activation of the Ranger Regiment, the establishment of light divisions, and a renewed emphasis on mid- to low-intensity conflicts emphasized the need for Ranger training. The Army recognized the need for Ranger qualified officers and non commissioned officers throughout the Army. The successful initiative was evident in December of 1989 when the 75th Ranger Regiment, alongside elements of heavy, light, and special operations forces, successfully accomplished their mission during Operation Just Cause. More recently, Ranger qualified officers and non commissioned officers have played a vital role in the successful accomplishment of Operation Desert Storm, Operation Restore Hope in Somalia, Operation Uphold Democracy in Haiti. Operation Enduring Freedom in Afghanistan, and Operation Iraqi Freedom. The Ranger course is 61 days in duration and is divided into three phases, each of which is at a separate geographical location. The first phase is here at Fort Benning and is conducted by the 4th Ranger Training Battalion, followed by three weeks in the Blue Ridge Mountains of Delano, Georgia, which is conducted by the 5th Ranger Training Battalion. And finally, three weeks in the Florida Swamps at Elgin Air Force Base, Florida, which is conducted by the 6th Ranger Training Battalion. The purpose of the Ranger course is to develop leadership capabilities, confidence, confidence, and combat functional skills of officer and non-commissioned officer volunteers in Ranger techniques and tactics, so that they, upon completion of the Ranger course, can return to their unit and conduct Ranger-type training, thus increasing the high level of training in the United States Army today and giving all infantry units the ability to conduct Ranger-type missions. The Ranger course is realistic, rugged, and hazardous. 
The Ranger students are taxed both physically and mentally during their nine weeks of training. In summary, we feel that the Ranger course is the highest level of combat preparedness that the United States Army has to offer today. We will now showcase some of the techniques and tactics that the Ranger students are taught to use. I will be followed by Staff Sergeant Isaac, a United States Army Ranger. Phase of Ranger School. I have served in various light and airborne infantry units, most recently as a squad leader in the 10th Mountain Division. I'm currently assigned to Bravo Company, 4th Ranger Training Battalion. The first technique the Rangers are trained to use is demolitions. Extensive demolition training enables the Rangers to attack and destroy a wide variety of objectives. Although there are several different types of explosives, Composition C4 is the one that is most commonly used. As you can see, it is a white plastic explosive that can be cut or molded into any shape. Due to the pliability of this explosive, it is used to construct a variety of expedient charges. Charges such as the ribbon charge. Ribbon charge is used to cut irregular shape or flat steel targets as shown here. Next we have the shape charge. The shape charge can be used against any hard surface objectives such as roads or vehicles. It can be easily improvised using any type of cone-shaped material. This one has been constructed using a number 10 can, and we've created the cone shape of the C4. Lastly, we have the timber cutting charge. Now, there are various methods used to emplace this charge. You can either have it as we do here, with the charge cake placed on one side of the tree, with the kicker charge placed further up on the tree, or you can cut one section of the tree and place the C4 into the cut, while once again place the the kicker charge further up on the tree to ensure direction of fall. Or you can simply encircle the entire tree, something like a ribbon charge. All demolitions are primed using the modernized demolition initiators, commonly known as MDIs. MDIs consist of high strength and low strength blasting caps attached to various lengths of time fuse or shock tube. These blasting caps, along with fuse igniters and detonating cord, are used to construct a variety of firing systems. Here we have a training board that showcases some of the firing systems and demolition accessories that Rangers are trained to use. First, we have the M81 fuse igniter. M81s are used to ignite either the time fuse or the shock tube. Next, we have the M14 time fuse with a length of approximately seven and a half feet and a burn time of roughly five minutes. It is used to detonate standard military explosives. Next, we have the M21 and M23 firing systems. With factory attached M81s and high strength blasting caps, they are also used to detonate standard military explosives as well as additional lengths of shock tube. Ladies and gentlemen, at the bottom of the board, you'll see some of the explosives the Ranger are trained to use. First, the M1 dynamite, which is used for cratering or ditching. Next, the M112 C4 block, which is used for cutting or breaching targets. TNT, which is a good all-around explosive, used in many military operations, and the flex linear charge, which is used to, to breach walls or doors. Ladies and gentlemen, if you will focus your attention to the far side of the pond, you will see a connex where we will use a flex linear charge. You will also witness the detonation of some of these other expedient charges. demonstrations. First, the ribbon charge. Notice the smooth, clean-cut effect. Next, we have the shape charge. Notice the large hole blown into the five-inch steel plate. And lastly, when employed properly, the timber cutting charge is capable of falling in any size tree. Ladies and gentlemen, now that you have seen some of the many uses and capabilities of Composition C4, a few of its characteristics are that it is virtually insensitive to shock or friction, and will most likely not detonate due to rough handling or struck by small arms fire. Easy. It's on battery, we gotta be careful. Oh, hey, no, well, let's give it the law to the front row and see if it's fine. 
Served in various light infantry units, most recently as a platoon sergeant in the 101st Airborne Division. I'm currently assigned to Alpha Company, 4th yeah! Ranger Training Battalion. Propelling is an integral part of the mountaineering instruction taught at the Ranger course. It's a means of descending a vertical surface through the use of a mechanical device. It is taught at the Ranger course for several reasons. First, it teaches the individual to overcome an inherent fear of heights. Second, it builds confidence in the individual and teaches them an additional capability. The Ranger student once again learns there is virtually no impassable terrain to a determined, well-trained, well-led force. In order to repel, certain items of mountaineering equipment are essential. First, the Colonel Metal Rope. This rope is 150 feet in length, 11 millimeters in diameter, with a tensile strength of 3,500 pounds. It has an additional characteristic of a lack of elasticity, meaning it will only stretch up to 2% under working conditions. All Rangers are trained in the use of the Army Mountaineering Kit, or AMK. The AMK is comprised of a nylon harness assembly, a figure eight friction adapter, and a lock and snap link with tensile strength of 2,000 pounds. Leather working gloves are worn to protect the hands. In order to repel, the Ranger simply bases the climbing rope with the anchor point on his left hand side. He then secures a bite of rope with his right hand, feeds it up through the lower larger opening of the figure eight and into the lock and snap link, which he then tightens. If he has not done so already, the ranger will go ahead and don his leather working gloves. To begin his descent, the ranger simply faces the anchor point and walks backwards down the surface of the cliff. Should he desire to stop during his descent, he simply tightens his grip with his right hand, which acts as his brake hand, supports his body weight, and controls his rate of descent. His left hand simply acts as a balancing or stabilizing agent. To continue his descent, the ranger simply loosens his grip with his right hand and continues down the surface of the cliff. In some cases, it may become necessary to haul personnel and equipment up a vertical surface. In order to do so, rangers are trained in the use of the vertical haul line, which consists of a large, heavy, eight-frame structure constructed and latched together at the top of the cliff, with sufficient rope to reach the ground. The rope is then ran through a pulley or a lock and snap link with the ends of the rope tied together, creating what is known as an endless rope. As the ranger goes up, the second butterfly knot comes down, allowing for the next ranger to engage their lock and snap link and begin their climb to the top. Another type of rappel that the ranger is taught is the Australian rappel. The Australian rappel allows the ranger to face in the direction of his descent. He utilizes his left hand as his brake hand, thus freeing up his right hand to fire his weapon should the need arise. Should a ranger become slightly injured or wounded, all rangers are trained in multiple casualty evacuation techniques, the first of which is the buddy repel. The buddy repel consists of the casualty being secured to the ranger by means of a lock and snap link and a zone runner to the ranger's own lock and snap link. The casualty rides in front of and across the lap of the ranger. During the descent, should the casualty require additional first aid, the ranger can simply break and apply it. <laughs> After that critical, life-saving first day, the rangers can continue their descent down to the ground. You may recall the terms on-repel and off-repel being utilized by the rangers. The term on-repel implies that the ranger is ready to begin his descent and for those beneath him to be on the lookout for falling rock or debris. The term off-repel is utilized once the ranger has touched down on the ground and is free of the rope and that the next ranger can begin their descent. Another type of insertion technique that the ranger is taught is the fast rope insertion and extraction system, or more commonly referred to as FRIES. 
The fry system consists of a three-inch diameter hemp rope that is 60 feet in length and secured to an aircraft by means of a modified h rail. This is done primarily at night. In a few moments, you'll see an aircraft approach the demonstration area. This aircraft is a UH-60 Black Hawk helicopter with an ACL, or allowable cargo load, of 13 combat equipped Rangers. As you can also see, there is sufficient space to land an aircraft, and in a normal situation, it would do so. However, today, for demonstration purposes, you'll see a four-man reconnaissance team inserted into the demonstration area on the far side of the pond. The first action you will observe is the aircraft commander stabilizing his aircraft over the target area. Once the aircraft is stabilized, the ropes will be deployed. Once the prize ropes have been deployed, the Ravens will begin their descent. Utilizing this method of insertion, a recon team can be inserted into a heavily vegetated or urban environment in a very short period of time. Ladies and gentlemen, direct your attention to the far side of the pond. As you'll notice on my demonstration sked coat located to your front, the casualty is secured within the sked with sufficient rope routed throughout the exterior holes. It is then joined above the casualty through the use of a locking snap link. The first action you'll observe when the aircraft arrives is the aircraft commander stabilizing his aircraft over the target area. Once the aircraft is stabilized, a combat medic will be lowered down onto the ground. Once on the ground, the combat medic will move to the casualty and begin his assessment. The recon team already on the ground will provide local security to the pickup site and assist the combat medic in his assessment. Once the combat medic has finished his assessment of the casualty, he will move to the winch, engage his locking snap link, and signal up to the aircraft commander. We will then hoist the casualty straight up and recover him into the aircraft before moving out to the nearest medical treatment facility. The rangers on the ground will assist through the use of a tagline. The tagline prevents the oscillation of the sked coat and prevents further injury to the casualty. Ladies and gentlemen, please direct your attention to the demonstration area on the far side of the pond.
States Army, every infantry battalion is equipped with a reconnaissance platoon. Each reconnaissance platoon is made up of a recon and sniper section that is made primarily of rank and qualified personnel. The primary mission of a recon team is to identify enemy personnel and equipment on the battlefield and report these locations back directly to the commander. This enables the commander to maneuver his elements on the battlefield in order to defeat the enemy. Because these recon teams are highly skilled and will be called upon to perform hazardous, hazardous missions in various climates and terrain, special extraction techniques have been devised, such as the SPIES rig, or special purpose insertion and extraction system. The SPIES system consists of a two-in-one type braided nylon rope that is 120 feet in length and one inch in diameter. Additionally, a nylon harness is worn by each ranger to be suspended from the rope. In a few moments, you will see a four-man reconnaissance team being extracted from a covered and concealed position on the far side of the pond. Once again, the first action you'll observe is the aircraft commander stabilizing his aircraft over the target area. Once that aircraft is stabilized, a bag will be thrown from the aircraft. The spice rope is thrown within a bag to ensure it does not become entangled underneath the aircraft. Once the rope is on the ground, the recon team will move forward, engage the locking snap links, and signal up to the aircraft commander. Should they receive effective small arms fire, the door gunner can suppress and neutralize these targets with the use of his M240 Bravo located inside of the aircraft. Ladies and gentlemen, please direct your attention once again to the far side of the pond. squad column fire team wedge. This is the most popular movement formation as it provides 360 degree security, equal distribution of men, weapons, and equipment, and the most commanding control for the squad leader.
Ladies and gentlemen, this nine-man light infantry squad is equipped and organized for a combat patrol. The squad leader. The squad leader is responsible for everything the squad does or doesn't do. He has the additional responsibility as the patrol leader. He is equipped with an M4 carbine. The M4 carbine is a modified version of the M16 that has a shorter barrel and a collapsible buttstock. The two team leaders. Both the Alpha and the Bravo team leader are responsible for their respective teams. The Bravo team leader has the additional responsibility as the assistant patrol leader. Both are equipped with the M4 carbine. The automatic riflemen. The automatic riflemen are equipped with the M249 squad automatic weapon, or SAW. The SAW is a lightweight, shoulder-fired, fully automatic weapon that primarily fires from a 200 round box of ammunition. However, in an emergency, it may fire from a 30 round magazine. The Grenadiers. Each Grenadier is equipped with an M320 grenade launcher. The M320 is capable of firing a variety of 40 millimeter projectiles to include high explosive, smoke, illumination, CS gas, and buckshot. Each Grenadier is capable of carrying up to 26 rounds on their ammunition belt. Finally, the two riflemen. Each rifleman is equipped with the M4 carbine. One of the riflemen has the additional responsibility as a squad RTO or radio telephone operator. He is equipped with the APRC 119 Tactical Seaguards FM radio that is capable of both voice and secure data transmission back to hire. The second rifleman carries the additional mountaineer equipment the squad may need on their combat patrol. You may notice other items of, this, of equipment to include the PBS-14, the ICOM radio, PEC-15, AT-4, Claymore, hand grenades, and Ranger First Responder bag. The AMPBS-14. The AMPBS-14 is a night vision monocle that allows for close-in viewing during the hours of limited visibility. The ICOM radio. The ICOM radio allows the squad leader to maintain communication with the squad throughout his combat patrol. The PEC-15. The PEC-15 is a laser designator that's capable of designating targets out to 400 meters with the aid of a night vision device. The M136, AT-4. The AT-4 is a lightweight, shoulder-fired, anti-armor weapon that is encased in an expendable fiberglass tube. It is capable of penetrating armor up to 14 inches thick. The M18, Claymore Mine. The M18 Claymore Mine is an anti-personnel mine that is composed of a pound and a half block of C4. When detonated, it will expel up to 700 steel ball bearings towards its target. The hand grenades. Each, grid, uh, each ranger is equipped with two M67 hand grenades. Additionally, every ranger is trained as a ranger first responder. The ranger first responder is equipped with the ranger first responder bag. The ranger first responder is capable of triaging, treating, and evacuating most life-threatening injuries found on the battlefield today. Ladies and gentlemen, this nine-man light infantry squad is equipped and organized for a combat patrol. Let's get a round of applause for the nine -man. Throughout the Ranger course, Ranger students are required to complete a series of confidence tests, the first of which you saw demonstrated earlier, the suspension traverse. Prior to any Ranger student conducting the confidence test, it must first be demonstrated by a Ranger qualified instructor. Today, Ranger Sumner is going to demonstrate the log walk rope drop. It consists of him climbing the vertical ladder, negotiating the horizontal log and the step obstacle in the middle, before making his way out to the rope, where he will use a combination of the commando crawl and the monkey crawl to make his way out to the Ranger tab where he will then hang free and request permission to drop some 40 feet below into the water. Let's give him some motivation, folks. Okay, ladies, we go.
type of waterborne insertion technique the rangers are taught. Keel casting is a means of inserting a major team into a body of water utilizing a helicopter. In a few moments, you'll see a four-man major team insert into the demonstration pond located to your front. The first action you'll observe is the aircraft coming in at 10 feet and 10 knots. Once over the demonstration area, a team of two rangers will push out their poncho wrap and exit on either side. The second team of two rangers will follow in the same manner. Once in the water, they'll make their way to the shore and continue on their major ranger mission. To construct a poncho wrap, the team of two rangers lay out a standard issue poncho, then place the rucksack and additional equipment and waterproof it to aid in its flotation. On one end is a tag line to allow one ranger to pull it from the front, while the second ranger can steer it from the rear. If they take small arms fire, once again, that door gunner can suppress and neutralize those targets with the use of his M240 Bravo machine gun. Ladies and gentlemen, please direct your attention to the center of the pond. Ladies and gentlemen, let's get a round of applause for our students. They have a little way to go. All Rangers are trained in hand-to-hand -hand combat. I'll be followed by Sergeant First Class Castillo, a United States Army Ranger. instructor here at the Bang Face Ranger School. I have served in several strike crew and light infantry units. Most recently as a weapon squad in the 10 Mountain Division. I'm currently assigned to Charlie Company! Yeah. Fourth Ranger Training Battalion. The average soldier will only train in the basic use of the weapon system. Maybe this is effectiveness if they should feather fire, but they should break the losing. But when, with the knowledge of hand-to-hand -hand combat, the confidence and aggressiveness to fight hand-to-hand, -hand, the Rangers are able to attack and defeat their opponent. In combat, Rangers often face with complex situations and which makes the enemy difficult to recognize. Imagine a team of rangers conducting a combat patrol in the mountains of Afghanistan or in the streets of Baghdad when they encounter a suspicious individual who appears to be unarmed but becomes hostile. Get down! No! Get down! No! Get down! No! techniques in jiu-jitsu. You'll not see my demonstrator at the top or mounted position. Yeah. From this position, he's able to deliver various strikes with fists and elbows, numerous arm bars, or even chokes. For example, the cross-collar choke. You'll not see my demonstrator at the bottom. Though at the bottom, he's still a dominant fighter. He uses his legs to control the distance between him and his opponent. Also from this position, he's able to deliver punches, chokes, or even arm bars. <laughs> the 
right spin wins the top is a good balanced position. You'll notice this is nothing more than a modified boxer's crouch with the weight equal and distributed over the feet. His hands hold high to protect his face or to be able to deliver a sharp disabling blow. This is referred to as the range of physical balance or the armbar position. Yeah. Major the next out the different ranges between hand-to-hand -hand combat. The first one being the projectile range. This is nothing more than an object from a shot or thrown at an opponent. Second is the striking range. This is the range where you can strike your opponent with the weapon, fist or kick. And third is the grappling range. The grappling range is further divided into the post, frame, and hook range. The post range allows my demonstrator to maintain separation between him and his opponent and allows for strikes to still be delivered. The frame range. Notice that my demonstrator still maintains separation between him and his opponent. He simply reduces it by placing his form on his opponent's chest. This allows for more strikes and the use of a secondary weapon, such as a knife. You notice that my demonstrator is completely close the distance between him and his opponent. This is referred to as the hook range and allows for more decisive blows. The next two fundamentals are ranging the top for hand-to-hand -hand combat is that of speed and accuracy. With the emphasis on these two fundamentals, that speed and accuracy can only be gained through practice. We teach our rangers to use any means available to attack and defeat their opponent, to include the element of surprise. We teach our students to choose the throws, holds, and takedowns. We will now demonstrate a few that we teach. First, the right hip throw. Yeah, the Lord! Second, the cross hawk takedown. And third, the front leg takedown. You'll notice that these might demonstrate in a very vulnerable position. <laughs> in the event the ranger is facing an opponent that is armed with a knife and he himself is unarmed, we also teach our rangers a series of right, uh, knife disarming techniques. You'll notice that the main objective is to gain possession of the knife. Therefore, we teach our rangers to use the knife fighting techniques, and the one will point that is for to strike your opponent with the knife. Kill! The counter to the upward stroke of the knife. Our Rangers, a series of 
students to write for disarming techniques. Therefore, we teach us, uh, our rangers a series of moves to transition to a secondary weapon, such as a knife. deep behind enemy lines without being detected. Thank you. 